today we're going to wrap up our series on paradigm shift. In a moment, we're going to look to Matthew chapter 7. And we're going to talk about this idea of shifting our goal. Shifting our goal. A couple days ago, it was the day after Thanksgiving, and our family, we set out on our goal that we have every single year, and that is the goal to find the perfect Christmas tree. How many of you set out to do that goal already? How many of you, you're like, Tyler, I already have the perfect Christmas tree. It's in my attic. I'll get it closer to Christmas. We started a tradition a number of years ago where we go to a specific Christmas tree farm, and it's one of those that you have to cut the tree. And so we're, we're heading out to this tree farm, and thankfully the weather this year was perfect. I mean, no, we don't always get that weather in November. I mean, it was sunny. It was beautiful. And so we're, we're journeying out to this tree farm, and we show up, and this tree farm is massive. And not only do we have to deal with the size of, of acreage at this tree farm, we have five individual voices and opinions of what the perfect Christmas tree is. Anybody know the pain that I'm talking about right now? And so we began to journey through the stretch of the Christmas tree farm, and one by one, we're, we're looking at the different trees, and we go out to this side of the farm, and we don't really see anything, and we begin to work across the back side of the farm this way, and all of a sudden, one of our children finds what they feel like is the perfect tree, but then another child sees a different tree that's just a little bit better, and then somebody else sees a tree that's just a little bit straighter. You know, and so we're, we're continuing this journey, and eventually we find ourselves on the back stretch of the Christmas tree farm. And we come into this clearing, and there's like this heavenly shaft of light beaming down on the tree. You know what I'm talking about. And we look at the tree, and we all say, hey, that's the one. And in this moment, we, we have to do what all modern people do. We, we have to capture the moment with a photograph. And just magically, our, our kids end up lined up around the tree like this. I don't know how they did this, but they just naturally lined up like that. <laughs> didn't have to coach them. Didn't have to tell them. Didn't even have to frame it up. It's just, just how that happens. Not even close, right? That, that shot took like 18 minutes just to get that one. <laughs> but then you have to get the the family Christmas photo with mom and dad in it. And so we're looking around, and because we're on the far stretch of the Christmas tree farm, there's not another soul in sight. And so I'm trying to figure out how to set the self-timer and prop it up on another tree and try to capture the right photo. That's not working. So I, I go walking and looking for any other human being. And eventually I bump into a couple, and I'm like, hey, can you help me take a photo? And these people look at me, and they're like, just you out here by yourself? I'm like, no, of our family. And so we journey back to the family, and once we get the photo, then we begin the process of sawing the tree down. And there's only one problem. Now that the tree has fallen over, we have to carry it all the way back to civilization. Why? Because my kids picked the tree on the far edge of the Christmas tree farm. And as we journey back, of course, they, they picked the largest tree we've ever picked out as a family. And you know, for those of you who've ever cut down your own tree, how a tree looks, your paradigm of how the tree looks in the field is a little bit different than when you actually get it inside the house. We decided this year we're going to get just a little bit taller tree because we'll put it, you know, upstairs where our ceilings kind of vault and uh, it, it looks like the perfect size in the field. And this is how the tree actually turned out. It's, uh, <laughs> it's tall. In fact, we had to break out our six foot ladder to help, help get the lights up on top. And I mean, it's just, just a whole new journey. And listen, to get that tree to where it is today, it took some determination. Can you say determination? It took some grit. It took some tenacity. I mean, hauling the tree with my two sons through the woods, trying to get that tree to the place where they can wrap it up and then get it on top of the car and then tie it down so it doesn't go flying away on the drive home, getting it off the top of the car, shaking it out, getting it in the stand, carrying it up the stairs, getting the lights on. Anybody know where I'm going? It takes some determination. It took a goal. Now, if I were to create a goal for 
my own personal idea of how Christmas trees should work would go a little bit like this. I would want a live living Christmas tree that somehow just got itself to my house. And then somehow by God's grace, it would never shed a single needle. And all God's people said, amen, right? Never shed a needle. Never deal with all of that. And somehow it would decorate itself on the day after Thanksgiving. And then magically by God's grace, it would get rid of its own decorations, get rid of itself on New Year's Day so I could be skiing or doing something else. But it doesn't work like that, right? I mean, goals are something that we're all driven by. In fact, as we begin to talk about Christmas, some of us, we already have our list of goals. I want to be done shopping by this date. I want to have all of the baking done by this date. I want to make sure that we can go visit that relative, but then be back home by this date, by this time. We're driven by goals. It's interesting, as we look at our lives, whether it's in your work, whether it's in your relationships, in your finances, in your health, we all have goals that we're driven by, consumed by. And as we've looked through Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7, Jesus has been laying out a a new paradigm of how we're to live life, especially as citizens in his kingdom. And here's what we come to learn. Maybe some of the goals that we've had, some of the goals that we've set our lives towards, need a little bit of a shift. They need a little bit of an adjustment. Today, as we look to the end of Matthew chapter 7, Jesus is going to lay out four different sets of two. In a moment, we're going to talk about two different roads that people can choose. We're going to talk about two different types of trees and the fruit that they produce. We're going to talk about two different types of followers and, and the claims that they make, but we're also going to talk about two different types of foundations that people set out to build their lives on. Jesus, he lines out all of these series and all of these sets of twos. And here's what I want us to recognize today. Following Jesus involves hearing, but it also involves doing. It involves hearing. In other words, we we need to hear his voice and listen to what he says, but then we have to do something with it. We have to put it to work. So it involves hearing and doing. It also involves saying, but also being. See, we're going to read some some things that Jesus says, and what he says, it's, it's pretty radical. It's pretty challenging. Because it's not enough just to say the right things. We we actually have to be the right people. And that's his goal as he lays out what life in this kingdom looks like. It's not about just doing activity for him. It's about being the people that he's called and created us to be. So we look at all these sets of twos, you'll notice that he doesn't talk about a third thing called the, the path that's almost the right path. He talks about the right path, the wrong path. He doesn't really give us this idea of the almost right path or the almost good fruit or the, the almost committed follower, the almost right foundation. He leaves it as an option, a a a determination, and here's what we need to understand about determination. Determination doesn't get us grace. It doesn't get us new life. That's a gift. Salvation is a gift. New life is a gift. You can't earn it. You can't deserve it. But what what does determination do in our lives? Well, it takes that new life, and it begins to work itself out to become the new people that he's calling and creating us to be. It takes determination to embrace a new paradigm. It takes a little bit of determination to live these new lives that God invites us to experience by his grace. And so with that in mind today, I want to share four questions and four truths about these final thoughts in Matthew chapter 7. The first question is this, what's my path? Can you say path? What's my path? Jesus says this in Matthew chapter 7. He says, you can enter God's kingdom only through the narrow gate. The highway to hell is broad and its gate is wide for the many who choose that way. But the gateway to life is very narrow and the road is difficult. And only a few ever find it. 
See, we hear Jesus' words, and again, he's talked uh, now through, throughout the last number of weeks about life in his kingdom and how it's a little bit upside down and inside out from how we often see it. And here as he's bringing this to conclusion, he, he talks about different ways that people can approach life, different paths that we choose to walk down. There's, there's a broad way, the, the path of least resistance, but here's what I want us to recognize. If the goal is always the path of least resistance, obedience is going to be hard to live out. Because sometimes obedience is going to come with some resistance. It's going to come with some challenges. It's going to be a little bit difficult, a little bit challenging. Why is Jesus being so exclusive in this moment? Well, it ties back to what he says in John 14, verse 6, when he declares, I am the way, the truth, the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. In other words, he's saying, listen, there's only one way to get on the right path. It's through me. It's not through your efforts. It's not through your generosity. It's not through all of your volunteerism. No, it's through me. That's why the road is narrow. And here's the truth that we need to understand. The road you travel always determines your destination. The road you travel in life, it always determines your destination. See, there's this thing theologically that we refer to it from time to time. It's called free will. Anybody ever met somebody who had some free will? Wouldn't you love it if like you had free will but nobody else did? Wouldn't that be nice? No, we, we all have free will. We all have the right to choose. And often when we talk about free will, we put it in a negative context. In other words, well, they have free will, so they're just going to keep making those bad decisions. But if you have free will to choose what's wrong, guess what that also means? It means that you have free will to choose what is right. In other words, it's not about just choosing what's wrong, but the same grace that gives you the, the ability to choose. You can choose to walk in this grace that God has provided for you. The question is, what's, what's my path? See, we need determination to stay on that path, to come back to this place, to, to work out what God has given to us in his grace, which is new life. We, we work this out through determination. We walk down that, that narrow road. How many of us recognize just because the path is easy doesn't mean the path is right? And at times, we, we want the easy path. But if we always choose the easy path when it comes to our finances, how many know that's not going to lead us to a place we actually want to get to? If we're always choosing the easy path when it comes to our physical health, how many of us recognize that's probably not going to create the six-pack? If we're always choosing the, the path of least resistance in our relationships, it's not always going to lead to where we want it to go. So what's the path? What's the path that, that you are journeying down today? Sometimes when we encounter resistance, we, we convince ourselves that something's wrong. Some of us, when we've encountered resistance in our lives because of the path that we're journeying, sometimes we, we make the mistake of confusing resistance as rejection. That somehow God has rejected us. God, I put my trust in you. It was supposed to get easier. Anybody made the mistake of believing that? I said yes to Jesus, and everything was supposed to just be simple from here on out. And It's not going to be simple. You just have somebody with you in the storm now. You have somebody with you in the challenge. So what's the path? Second question, what's the fruit? Can you say fruit? What's the fruit? Jesus says this in Matthew chapter 7, verse 20. He says, yes, just as you can identify a tree by its fruit, so you can identify people by their actions. What's the fruit? We know that if a tree is, is growing apples, we know that it is an apple tree. If it's growing oranges, we know it's an orange tree. You see, in the context of what Jesus is talking about, immediately he's, he's talking about being aware of false teachers and how you can identify a false teacher not by their words, but by the fruit of their lives. Look at the evidence. And yet this is challenging for us because we have to also stop and consider if that's true about false teachers, it must also be true about me. Because all of our lives are producing something, but we have to stop and consider today, what is 
the fruit. Here's the truth we need to understand. The nature of the tree always determines the nature of the fruit. The nature of the tree, it always determines the nature of the fruit. In other words, if you want to change the fruit, you have to be willing to change the root. Because ultimately, all the fruit is is evidence of what the root is. So some of us, we, we have some fruit in our lives and we're looking at it and we're going, man, I, I want this to change. But are you willing to not just deal with the outside things? Are you willing to get down to the root level? Because that fruit grows and it's cultivated over time. A number of years ago, I planted a, an apple tree in my backyard and I walked out the next morning and there was no apples on it and I was shocked. I was about to take it back to Costco. Why? Because I expect the right fruit. But, but here's the reality, friends. Fruit grows over time. But here's the challenge. We live in a world, in a culture, we just want to medicate the, the external. We just want to deal with the externals. We don't actually want to have to get down to the inside level, deal with the root. But, a friend, the nature of the tree always determines the nature of the fruit. What's the fruit in your life, fruit, it's cultivated over time. Jesus says this in John 15, if you abide in me, you will bear much fruit. A number of years ago, Amber and I, we, we lived in Yakima, and there's apple orchards everywhere, and we, we'd walk by apple orchards, I would ride my bike past apple orchards, and it's interesting, never once did I hear this sound coming from an orchard. I never heard the apple trees just, just straining and groaning and grunting to develop fruit. Can you imagine walking by an apple tree and it's just stressing out like, bloop. oh, there we go, good. <laughs> Doesn't do that. Why? Because since it's tapped in, since the roots are connected to the right thing, fruit will naturally come. But listen, I've, I've met some Jesus followers. There's been seasons in my life following Jesus where I've been like, just, just trying to do the right thing, trying to bear the right fruit. But we need to understand fruit is a natural byproduct of having the right root system connected to the right things. If I want to change the fruit, I have to be willing to address the root. I have to be willing to address it. By the way, there's a difference between having a bad day and bad fruit. How many of you are thankful that just because of one bad day, God doesn't chop the tree down? <laughs> Come on, somebody. Like, thank God. There's a difference between a bad day and bad fruit. But, but let me remind us, if we've been having a bad day for the last decade... We might want to check the root. Because maybe we need to unplug from the root system we're currently in, and we need to do what it talks about in Romans and be grafted in to the, the new reality, which is Jesus Christ. What's the fruit? Everybody say, what's the path? What's the fruit? Here's the third question. What's my claim? Can you say claim? What's my claim? Jesus says this in Matthew 7. Verse 21, not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who actually do the will of my Father in heaven will enter. What's he talking about here? He's talking about obedience. He's talking about obedience. He goes on. On judgment day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name and cast out demons in your name and perform many miracles in your name, but I will reply, I never knew you. Get away from me, you who break God's law. Some of these words are, are got to be some of the most sobering words in all of Scripture. Because what this is saying is, listen, we, we could try to get the words right, and we could even try to get the works right, but if we're disconnected from obedience, and if we're disconnected from actual relationship, we could be busy doing things for God and not realize that I don't even know him. Jesus wants relationship with us. He wants us to actually know him, not just know stats about him, not know information about him, but living relationship, abiding relationship. You see, here's the truth. 
who you know determines the reward you get. So it's not just what I do for God, it's, it's actually knowing Jesus. It's, it's walking in relationship with him. And when we walk in relationship with him, it, it stirs a heart that desires obedience. First John says it this way, and we can be sure that we know him if we obey his commands. Do you know, obedience isn't legalism, obedience is actually love. When we walk in this relationship with Jesus, this is how this claim lives itself out because we don't just want to say all the right things. Friends, we want to be people who walk in relationship with him. In other words, I don't want to get to the end of my days and say, Jesus, look at all that I did for you. I mean, look at, look at all this stuff that I did for you. And he goes, who, who are you? Who are you? Activity is not a substitute for association. We need to lean into relationship. We need to know Jesus. I can't just do things for him without knowing him. What's my path? What's my fruit? What's my claim? Here's the fourth and final question. What's my foundation? Can you say foundation? What's my foundation? Jesus says this in verse 24. Anyone who listens to my teaching and follows it is wise like a person who builds a house on solid rock. Jesus here, he talks about two different builders. And the difference between the two builders, we need to understand something. The, the difference was not hearing. They both heard. The difference wasn't building. They both built. The difference wasn't that one faced a storm, one didn't. They both faced storms. Jesus said the difference was one actually put it into practice. One didn't just listen. One actually implemented it, lived it out. What's my foundation? You see, we need to understand what you build on always determines the stability and the finish. What you build life on, friends, it matters. It matters. See, Here's what I'm convinced of. In the generation that we live in, we do not have an information issue. In fact, many of us, we have smartphones and we have multiple Bible apps on our phone. With a simple search, we could dig into the root word and what the Greek actually means. We could dial up a podcast of some of the world's finest preachers. Listen, we don't have an information issue. What we have, though, is an application issue. We have an implementation issue. We're not lacking information. And what, what we need to stop and consider is if that's true, why is there so many people who are spiritually starving? Why is that the case? We have, we have more access to truth than we've ever had, any other generation has had, and it's because there's an activation issue. There's an implementation issue in our lives. What's the foundation? You see, just as a building will never be stronger than its support structure, neither will our lives be stronger than the foundations that they are built upon. And today, here's our hope. No matter where we may find ourselves, God has more than enough to pull you out of where you are currently at and set your foot on a new rock. See, when I was young, I, I used to sit right over here in this section. You know, that's a blessed section right there. Yeah, right. <laughs> now, I remember hearing Pastor Buntain make this statement over and over. It's never too late to begin again. Friends, today, listen, there's some here today, and you say, Tyler, I've been journeying down the path of least resistance my whole life, and here I am all these years later, all these months later, all these decades later, and I'm just, I'm on the wrong path, and here's what I want you to know. It's never too late to get yourself onto the right path. That's God's grace. You may look at the fruit of your life and say, Tyler, there's some, there's some bad fruit, and I don't know if, if I have the strength to kind of dig up the root system and try to replant at this stage of life, but here's the good news about God's grace. He can pull you out of where you are and graft you in to the true vine named Jesus Christ, and you will begin to bear fruit for him. It's never too late 
to begin again. There's some of us, we've been busy making all the right claims, we have all the right words, some of us we have the right works, but we don't actually know Jesus. Jesus said, this is the work that God's given you to do, to, to believe, to know me as your source. Friends, it's never too late to begin again. Some of us, we look at the foundation that we've been building upon in years and years, decades and decades, and we go, well, Tyler, I'm this far down the road. I, I don't know. I don't know, if, I don't know if I can start over. I don't know if I can go back down to the foundation. But here's the good news. Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone, as it talks about in Scripture. And we can build our lives upon him by a moment in God's grace. You can go from an unstable foundation to being built upon a rock that does not move, does not shift, does not change. Today, can I invite you to stand to your feet all across this place? I want to take a moment, and I want to pray. And I would ask that over the next couple of moments, nobody leave, nobody move. Take a moment with me just to bow your heads all across this place, and even those of you who are watching online, here's, here's what I want you to know. It's never too late to begin again. Maybe you're on the wrong path today. By God's grace, you're going to find the new path. Maybe you've been bearing the wrong fruit. By God's grace, you're going to begin to abide in Jesus, and you're going to begin to produce the fruit that he desires. Maybe you've been making all the right claims, but the reality is there's a lack of relationship. Today, 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 you can walk out of this place knowing Jesus knowing him. Today, we all have the opportunity to embrace the real foundation. So across this room, if, if that's your desire and you want to know that you're made new, you want a fresh start with God by putting your trust in the work that Jesus has done for you. Friend, if that's you, can I invite you to, to just simply raise a hand, just hold it up for a moment and say, that's me. I, I desire that fresh start with God. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Uh, others would say, yeah, that's me. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, in the balcony, and say, yeah, that's me, that's me. Thank you, thank you. Can we pray this prayer out loud together? Would you repeat after me? Say, Jesus, thank you for loving me. I put my trust in you. Thank you for your grace. Forgive me of my sin. Make me a new creation. Help me to embrace the true path. Help me to produce the right fruit. Help me to walk knowing you. Help me to build my life as you, as my foundation. Strengthen me each and every day. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen. Come on, today can we celebrate those who are making that decision?